We welcome you. Welcome in the name of the Lord, and we trust that you've had a great and a wonderful week, and I'm hoping that uh, we'll be able to uh, uh, be really, really happy today. Before I talk about happy juice, I know you want to hear about happy juice, right? And uh, I think we all do. I just want to remind you that the happy Thanksgiving letter is out. I hope you've received it. Brother Joe was going around. He didn't receive it. There should be some. There's a Thanksgiving letter and why we should be thankful. And there's a little uh, uh, envelope with a Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving offering. We would like to try to get out of debt. Our solar system is down to 15000 a little bit less than that. And so the offering will go towards that, towards the principal, so we can get out of debt and uh, be able to, well, would that be wonderful to say that, you know, uh, we don't have any debts at all. Okay. So anyways, pray about that. Let the Lord work on your heart. And, and don't give because I'm asking you, but give because the Lord wants you to be like him to be a cheerful giver. Secondly, also, the calendars have come in, and I tell you, they are absolutely just gorgeous uh, with a scripture, and every week you begin with a verse of scripture, so you've got a, a scripture for, for the whole week, and you can memorize that scripture, you can give it to unbelievers. This year, what we decided is I know people are struggling financially, and we used to give these or sell these for seven. We're only going to sell them for five dollars. It's not about the church making money, but it's about getting the word of the Lord. They make wonderful, wonderful Christmas gifts. We only have two boxes, and so anyways, uh, take a look at them. Just look at them, and uh, they're probably cheaper than uh, some of your local uh, uh, stores as well. Well, the moment you've been waiting for okay, is we're going to talk this morning about happy, happy juice. Okay? Uh, I was, and judging from uh, the smiles out there, uh, uh, I wonder if some of you have already been nipping into the happy juice this morning. <laughs> uh, but you know what I'm talking about, happy juice. Uh, we've all, I'm sure, tried it at one time or another. I would be surprised if there was people here who have never, never touched it. But I'm sure that uh, we want to talk about that. And especially uh, the question, is it wise or unwise for Christians to drink alcohol? Uh, we're in the book of Proverbs. We're still in Proverbs. And there's so many uh, different subjects and one of the subjects that the book of Proverbs talks about is alcohol. And I know that many, many Christians have got their, their own opinions uh, concerning that. Okay. So I'm asking this morning, I'm not asking should Christians drink alcohol or not. That is not the question. And as soon as we start telling you, you should not drink alcohol or have one or two, uh, whatever. Uh, I think it, we become legalistic. Uh, Christianity becomes a list of do this, don't do that. And the last thing that we want to do is become legalistic. We want to be spirit-filled, full of grace uh, Christians, and we want to operate in grace. And I think it's the Holy Spirit who needs to speak to your hearts concerning uh, not whether you should drink or not, but is it wise? Is it wise to drink alcohol? So we want to deal with that question this morning. There are many, many reasons why people drink. Okay? Uh, I drink to be cool. Uh, I drink to be accepted socially. Uh, I drink to overcome my insecurities. I drink to have fun. I drink to be happy. Uh, I drink to forget my troubles. And so, 
If you are a drinker, uh, there are reasons behind that why you drink or even why you don't drink. When you, when you look at these reasons, they're really not reasons at all. They're really excuses. And if you have to drink to be cool or to be accepted, uh, if you have to drink to, because you're insecure and, and as you drink, uh, you come out of this bubble shell and, and you're happy, happy, happy. Uh, if that's the reason why you drink, okay? or if you drink just to have fun or be happy or to forget your troubles, you're really drinking for the wrong reason. Uh, some of these things is really, you, uh, what you need is not alcohol. What you need is really, you need Jesus. And so this morning I'm speak, specifically speaking to Christians. If you're out there and you're not a Christian, uh, this sermon does not apply to you. And so the question is, what does the Bible say? Uh, without being judgmental on anyone. What does the Bible say? Well, on the one hand, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes says, Go, <laughs> eat, and uh, eat your bread with joy, and, and drink your wine with a merry heart. Uh, eat, drink, uh, be merry. Uh, drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved it. What you do. You see, the Bible tells me I need to drink and, and I need to, I, God has already approved that on the one hand. On the other hand, the scripture talks about how wine is a mocker and beer or other translations have the word strong drink. Uh, beer is a brawler and whoever is led astray by them is not wise. Uh, he's not saying that beer or alcohol or wine is a mocker, it's a brawler. He's to, it's a metaphor for those who are under the influence, under the control of alcohol. They begin mocking and they begin brawling or arguing and fighting. And so, and if you're led astray by alcohol, you're not wise. The book of Proverbs says. On the other hand, Jesus did make wine. Jesus appeared at the uh, uh, wedding of Cana. And it must have been a wonderful time with the disciples. And, and they were drinking the cheap wine. And they ran out. And, and Jesus made more wine. And, uh, and uh, the, the, the master of the ceremony says, uh, you've kept the best for last. And I'm sure that the wine that Jesus made was probably the best wine that he uh, made. And I think that that's why at the Last Supper, Jesus said, I will not drink of this cup anymore until I come uh, in the kingdom with you. And the scripture does say in the book of Psalms that, that there is wine that makes the heart glad. It really is. On the other hand, uh, Excess leads to drunkenness. There are people who have been drunk. We think of Noah and Lot and Nabal and, and uh, you know, it was, it was customary uh, in the days of the Jewish holidays to drink, to have wine. See, the Bible says there's wine, so we need to drink wine. What I want you to consider, what I want you to remember this morning is that in the Bible, okay, when the Bible talks about wine, especially new wine, new wine was simply grape juice that when the harvest was uh, brought in and, and they would go and they gather the clusters of grapes and, and they would put them in wine vats. And down at the bottom of the wine vats, there were like little spigots and, and containers to catch. And they would actually walk or tread uh, in the uh, wine vats. 
And they would literally just step on the grapes and, and the juice would begin to flow out. They would catch them. And that was unfermented new wine. Okay? Uh, in a commentary, it says the wine of Judea was pure juice of the grape without mixture of alcohol. It was the common drink of people and did not produce intoxic intoxication from the commentary by Al Barnes. And so when the scripture talks about drinking wine, we cannot associate that with the wine that we have today. New wine was simply grape juice. And they drank it all the time, and so uh, they drank wine. Uh, even little children drank wine. But it was not fermented wine. On the other hand, uh, you could take the grape juice and put them in fermented jars. You would add sugar, you would add leaven, or what we would call the yeast today. And with the sugar and the yeast and everything, and it would actually take the juice and actually uh, change it into alcohol. So there was what was called fermented wine. You could not bring it new wine into the sanctuary as a drink offering. And the wine had to be in fermented jar for at least 40 days. I don't know why 40 days, maybe that's the, the process that it took to convert it from just juice into uh, fermented, intoxicating. Uh, but the scripture does say that, that once that the wine was added either sugar or leaven, it became a fermented, and you could get drunk. But you had to drink so much. In fact, in the days of the scriptures, you had to drink about 10 glasses of wine. One glass, about four or five ounces, was probably about 1 to 1.2% of alcohol. So you had to drink literally 10 glasses of wine for one glass of wine today. When you look at the content of wine today, uh, you think of ethanol. Uh, ethanol is pure alcohol. It is 100%. Uh, you're familiar with it, with the rubbing alcohol, some is 91% alcohol. Uh, rubbing alcohol, some is 70% alcohol. And even in, in uh, certain days, I don't know if they still do it, but they used to, if you were hard up and you didn't have alcohol, liquor, you would literally drink al rubbing alcohol as well. Okay? And that was because of the, the alcoholic content. But a one ounce of, uh, I'm sorry, a one five ounce glass of most wines would give you anywhere between 10 to 15 percent of alcohol. Whereas when you compare that to the wine of the New Testament, maybe, maybe 1 to 1.2 percent of alcohol. If you drank strong liquor, you're talking anywhere between 30 to 50 percent alcohol. Bacardi rum was uh, 75% uh, because it's distilled. And so there's a difference when we're talking about the alcohol today as opposed to in biblical days. Okay? And so no wonder uh, the scripture says wine makes glad the heart. Okay? But there's a different concentration. So what that means is that if you had one can of beer or one malt liquor that was about eight to nine ounces, or, or one five ounce glass of, of wine, or one shot. There were different concentrations of uh, alcohol. In one can, it would be 5% alcohol, and a malt liquor glass of 12 ounces, it would be 7% alcohol. In a five ounce, one five ounce glass of wine, there was 12%. And in one shot, there is 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 percent alcohol, depending on what you drank. Now, the interesting thing is that, is that 
the legal limit to be legally drunk will take you to a blood alcohol level of 0.08. It's not even 1%. So imagine you're having one drink or another, a second drink or take legally, depending on your age, and depending on your body type, whether you're male or female, there's, and your experience with alcohol, okay, it is possible to have one drink and be legally drunk. And so if you were to have one or two drinks, and start driving, and you're pulled over, guess what? They would give you a breathalyzer, and if you cross the 0.08 uh, uh, bl uh, blood uh, uh, alcohol content, you'd be arrested. So the question is, you know, is it worth it? Is it worth to go out and have one drink, two drinks? And let's face it, most people that go out to drink, they don't go out to have one drink or two drinks. Uh, it is party time and time for happy, happy juice. Well, what does the book of Proverbs say? Uh, it talks about woe. It talks about sorrow or contention or complaints, wounds without cause, uh, redness in the eyes. Okay? So let's take a look at that this morning. Okay? So I put it up there on the screen. I hope you can read it. Uh, if not... It's in Proverbs chapter 23, beginning at verse 19. Listen, my son, and be wise. This is Solomon speaking to his son. He says, I want you to be wise. And I want you to set your heart on the right path. If you're unwise if you're on the wrong path. So be wise and set your heart on the right path. And look what he says. Do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat. For drunkards and gluttons become poor and drowsiness clothes them in rags. And notice what he's talking about. He said, if you're going to be wise, you don't want to hang around with those who join themselves and they drink too much. Uh, too much wine, or they gorge themselves with, with meat, and they're called drunkards. Don't hang around drunkards, and don't hang around those who are gluttons. And the reason is that they become poor, and drowsiness is going to clothe them in rags. In Proverbs chapter 23, again in verse 29, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaints? Who has needless uh, bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? Those who linger over wine. To linger, just kind of hang around and just uh, have a glass of wine and you're just lingering and you, uh, one more, one more for the, for one more round over here, okay? Uh, but look what he's talking about. There are those who, who have woes or sorrows, uh, strife, complaints, needless bruises, bloodshot eyes. Just those who drink. Those who drink and linger over wine, who go to sample bowls. Now notice mixed wine. And the, mixed was, the wine was mixed with other uh, uh, elements. Just like Jesus when they, they went to give him wine uh, mixed with vinegar. As scripture said he refused to drink it. But notice what it says. Do not gaze at wine when it is red and it sparkles in the cup and it goes down smoothly. A nice sip of wine. And the book of Proverbs is all about being wise and walking on the right path in life. He says that wine, it's beautiful, it looks great, it's red, 
or white, I guess, depending on what kind of wine you, you get. It sparkles in the cup, and it goes down smoothly. But, look what he says, in the end, it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Your eyes will see strange sights, and your mind will imagine confusing things. You will be like one sleeping on the high seas, lying on top of the ribbing. They hit me, you will say. But I'm not hurt. They beat me. And I don't feel it. When will I wake up so I can find another drink? And this is probably almost describing the person, those who linger over wine. And it began with one drink, and somehow, as it's red and sparkles, in the end, okay, it's going to, the scriptures, it's going to bite you like a snake. And it's going to poison you like a viper. I'm sure that none of you would uh, allow snakes and, and vipers and poisonous snakes in your homes. You wouldn't do that. Why? Because you know that they're deadly. And I think that what he's talking about is that wine seems to be so appealing. And it looks so beautiful, and it sparkles, and it just goes down smooth. But in the end, it strikes. And it's dangerous. And it's poisonous. You're going to you look at your eyes. He says, your eyes, you're going to see strange sights. It affects the body. Okay? Your eyes will begin to see strange things. Look what it does to the mind. Your mind will imagine confusing things. And you're going to be like one sleeping on the high seas and lying on top. And, and guess what? He says, uh, you're even going to get beat up. <laughs> oh, I'm okay. I'm okay. That's all right. They hit me. I'm not hurt. <laughs> uh, I don't feel it. Why? Probably because the alcohol has taken over and it is biting you and it is dangerous and destructive to your body. Allow me to describe how alcohol and consuming alcohol affects us. Number one, it clouds our minds. It impedes our thinking. It affects our judgment. And you probably say, well, I can tell you, I can, I can drink a, a six-pack. I, I can drink half a, uh, you know, half, half a quart of uh, 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 gin or, or vodka or whatever. I can, I can take it. I'm a man. I'm a woman. But remember, I want you to go back to the very, very first time of your first drink. First time ever of your first drink. I can remember mine. And I can remember my first beer. Oh, it was bitter. It was, it was nasty. It was <laughs> terrible. And, and I remember my, my roommate said, how is it? Oh, it was good. It was wonderful. And I'm lying. And then as one beer, I'm halfway through the beer. All of a sudden, my mind is like, it's like I become fuzzy. It's like all of a sudden, I got a buzz. Whoa, ho, ho, ho. happy, happy juice. Yeah, this is nice. And then all of a sudden, it begins to affect my thinking. Uh, alcohol is really a depressant. And it literally just slows down your reaction. And your reaction time is, is affected and it's influenced because of the alcohol. Uh, the alcohol really masks the, the, the reality of what's real in life. And it even lowers your moral barriers and, and safeguards and sound judgment. That's what alcohol does. Alcohol can cause physical damage to our bodies. And when you look at your body from the moment that the alcohol begins to go in, the blood vessels begin to dilate. It, something happens. 
with even the first drink, uh, the, the first time that you did it. And maybe over time you've gotten used to it and maybe you, you build kind of a, an immunity and, and maybe you're, uh, you, you drink every day. And maybe you're a functional alcoholic. And I've met people, but they get up in the mornings and the first thing that they got to do is that they got to have a drink. And they function. I should say they can't function unless they have their first drink. But when you look at the effects of what it does over time, one drink, and that's how it all began, over time, excessive alcohol use can lead to chronic diseases, high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, liver disease, digestive problems, breast cancer, cancer of the mouth, the throat, the colon, and esophagus. Alcohol can even cause mental health problems such as depression and anxiety. And when you think about alcohol, how it interferes with, with your memory, uh, it interrupts your sleep patterns, it affects your energy, your moods, your anxiety levels. Uh, alcohol directly affects the central nervous system because it's a depressant that interferes with your moods. Have you ever seen it? You've seen people, uh, you know, when, when, when they drink, it's like some are just go into like a, a, a mood slumber and, and others become violent and uh, others become giggly and happy. And they yeah. come out of their shell. Why? Because it's affected the nervous system. It begins with wondering it affects the nervous system so that it begins to affect your body functions. It can contribute to being impulsive. It can lower your inhibitions and your, your choices that intensify, intensify shame and anxiety and depression. It may even increase the likelihood of using other substances. And so the list goes on. And it's especially dangerous if you use, use it in combination with other medications. Uh, believe it or not, uh, alcohol is really dangerous. And it begins with one drink, and then you begin to rationalize. Well, I can take it. And so, bring it on. Bring on the happy juice. But I want to show you some reasons why you need to avoid alcohol uh, because of what the scripture says. Not because of what I say, but because of what the scripture says. Look at Hosea 4, 11. Whoredom, wine, and new wine. Look what it says. Which takes away the understanding. Uh, maybe it makes you buzzy, uh, feeling happy. Okay? And you're drinking this happy juice and you're having a good time. But the whole time, it really takes away, the Bible says, it takes away your understanding. Okay. Uh, and so we need to be sober-minded. Okay. Why should you be sober-minded? I think because the scripture says your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. And that's usually when he's going to strike when you have been at drinking. Let me give you a few examples of those in the scriptures who abstained and did not drink alcohol. In the Old Testament, there were those called the Nazarites. They were the consecrated ones. They were set apart for God's special services. Number six said, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, whether a man or woman shall separate themselves to a vow of being a Nazarite. Uh, Samson was a Nazarite. You know the story of Samson. But look what it says about the mother. She may not eat any of thing that comes from the vine. Neither let her drink wine or strong drink or eat anything unclean. She, while she was carrying the baby, she was not to participate in that. And we're told that Samson was a Nazarite. He's consecrated 
and the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him. And I think there's a correlation between whether you use alcohol and how much of the Holy Spirit actually uses you. Uh, look at John the Baptist. What it says about John the Baptist. He shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, for he shall be filled with the Spirit from the womb. And we know what a tremendous ministry that John the Baptist had. But he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And the scripture says he was not to drink any wine because he was consecrated for the purposes of the Lord. Uh, when you look at the Rechabites, okay, I, I want to take a look at this closely. So take your Bibles and go to Jeremiah chapter 35. Uh, this is the word of the Lord that comes to Jeremiah uh, during the reign of Jehoiakim. It's near the end. It's almost time for them to go off into captivity. But that hasn't ha happened yet. Uh, the Lord speaks to Jeremiah and he says in verse 2, Go to the Rechabite family and invite them to come to one side uh, room of the house of the Lord and give them wine to drink. So I went to get Jehazaniah, a son of Jeremiah, the son of uh, Habazinia, and his brothers and all of his sons, the whole family of the Rechabites. So he goes to get these people, the Rechabite family. I brought them, verse 4, into the house of the Lord and into the room of the sons of Hanan, the sons of Igdaliah, the man of God. It was next to the room of the officials, which was over that of Maaseh, son of Shalom, the doorkeeper. And then I set bowls full of wine and some cups before the men of the Rechabites. And I said to them, drink some wine. But they replied, we do not drink wine. Because our forefather, Jonadab, son of Rechab, gave us this command. Now, you probably don't have a clue who Jonadab is. Jonadab was the fellow who joined himself with Jehu in the fight of Ahab. And uh, together, they went out. And somehow, something happened to Jonadab, Jonadab's life. And after that whole episode, this is the command that he gave his family. Look what he says. Uh, I lost my place here. Okay. Uh, let's see. I said a drink. We don't drink wine because our forefather, Jonadab, son of Rechah, gave us this command. Now do the math. Jonadab existed, lived during the period of uh, Jehu. And now this is the time of Jeremiah. 250 years has gone by. This is important, okay? Now look what Jonadab commanded his family and the families to come to pass. He says, neither you nor your descendant must ever drink wine. And you must never build houses, sow seed, or plant vineyards. And you must never have any of these things, but you must always live in tents. And you will live a long life in the land where you're nomads. So this was the command that Jonadab gave his family that was passed down now 250 years later. And look what they said. We have obeyed everything our forefather Jonadab, son of Rechab, commanded us. Neither we nor our wives or our sons and daughters have ever drunk wine or built houses to live in, have vineyards. Why vineyards? Because you have grapes and you make wine and you drink and you get drunk, right? Fields of crops, we've lived in tents. And we have fully obeyed everything our forefathers, Jonadab, commanded us. But when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, uh, invaded the, this land, we said, come, let's go to Jerusalem to escape Babylonia and the Aramean armies. And so have we have remained in Jerusalem. Now, it's interesting what happens, okay? 
Look at verse 17. Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty God says, the God of Israel. Listen, I'm going to bring upon them disaster. Then Jeremiah, verse 18, said to the family of the Rechabites, This is what the Lord says, the God of Israel. You have obeyed the command of your fathers, Jonadab, and followed all his instructions. You've done everything he ordered. Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Jonadab, son of Rechab, will never fail to have a, a man serve me. What's the point? The point that somehow, whatever Jonadab was seeing with Jehu in, in the killing of uh, all the, 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 the uh, uh, priests of Baal. And I'm sure that when they kill the priests of, of Baal, then they went out and they celebrated. And I think that Jonadab saw something of what alcohol does and how it affects people. And he commanded his family, don't ever drink. And I remember reading this many, many, many years ago, probably 30, 40 years ago. And I made a promise that I would teach my children never to ever drink wine. I have six of them. Did any of them listen? Not a single one of them. Well, maybe one of them. But I think this is quite serious, okay? It's like they followed the instructions of their fathers and the family. We don't want wine. We, we have never drank wine. Uh, look what uh, Proverbs 31 says. A mother's advice to the king. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine. Nor for princes to drink intoxicating drink. And notice why. Okay. These are the leaders. Okay. Don't indulge in wine drinking or strong drinks. Lest they drink and forget the law. It affects your mind and you don't see it. You just see some of the effects in your body. But it affects your mind and they forget the law. And they begin to pervert justice to all the afflicted. Instead, give strong drink to him who's perishing. Wine to those who are bitter hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. And what she is really saying is that don't drink wine. Don't drink strong drink. Because it will affect you and you're going to forget the law and you're going to pervert justice. Instead, if you're going to give wine, give it to those who have problems. Uh, give it to those who are struggling in life, uh, those who are or perishing, uh, those who are sick and dying, uh, to those who are bitter of heart, and to those who are poor. Give it to those who are going through hard times. Why? Because you forget. <laughs> uh, that's what alcohol does. It makes you forget. And that's why we drink to forget our problems. And it affects our minds. But I know, I know some of you probably by now say, yeah, but the Bible says to drink wine. Uh, isn't that what Paul said to Timothy? Uh, Paul, he says, uh, Paul says, no longer drink only water. And a little wine, a Greek word there is oinos, and where we get our English word wino. Okay? Uh, drink a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmity. Yes, but Paul is not writing to the church. He's writing to Timothy. And somehow, with the water issues and the problems and the health issues, drink a little wine and Timothy had some kind of infirmity. Drink a little wine for, your, for you, Timothy. He's talking to Timothy. Uh, not to the church. Paul is not saying get out and drink some happy juice. That is not what he's saying. Uh, the second argument is uh, some of the latest statistics uh, are coming out shows that taking a moderate amount of wine may be, notice the word may be, helpful for our hearts and lowers cholesterol and high pressure. Maybe. That may be true for the moment, for the now. But when you begin to consider the long run, 
It is disastrous. It is dangerous. Why? Because alcohol interferes with the brain's communication. As soon as you drink it, it goes into your blood system, and the first thing that it does, it goes to your brain. It affects the communication pathways that affects the process of information. That's why that we can say stupid things and do stupid things when we've been drinking. When we're drunk, uh, it begins with euphoria, a little buzz. Happy, happy juice, I feel good. This is wonderful. Uh, I remember when my sister had her first glass, uh, first glass of champagne. We were celebrating, and I saw her just become so giggly and out of control and, and loose. That was the first time, first glass. And that's how it begins, it begins, euphoria. Okay? But it goes into afterwards, you become depressed. You just sit there and, oh, man. And, and you're, you're disoriented. You begin to, uh, did I do this? Where's my watch? Where's my money? Uh, where's my phone? Uh, you begin to have excitement and there's confusion and stupor. And the more and the more that you drink and think, wow, this is happy juice, wonderful time. This is great. It can actually lead you into a coma. You can die. Is that really wise? I tried to find it and I couldn't, but many, many years ago, I found a study that Yale uh, did. Yale University did a study on the effects of drinking. And the bottom line, and I can't show you, I can't prove it, except I wouldn't lie to you. It's one drink, just one drink. Is enough to destroy about 10 brain cells. Why? Because the alcohol level immediately to the, goes to the brain. And one drink, that study said, drink, uh, kills 10 brain cells. But one big drunk kills about 10,000 brain cells. And once they're dead, that's it. And no wonder you, you have people who've been drinking over years and they're just like, a uh, mush mine. Uh, they've done studies with the brain of people that don't drink alcohol and, and people that drink low alcohol and, and people that have a lot of alcohol and you begin to see, you see a normal brain and then little by little you begin to see the changes in the brain and it affects the pathway to the full alcoholic where the brain has been just completely just changed. Is it really wise? to drink alcohol. It affects your mind, it affects your body. But consider biblically that if you drink alcohol, you may be a stumbling block to other people. Look at Daniel. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. He knew that he had the king's food and the king's wine, the king's happy juice. He knew that he would defile himself. And he said, please, please, please. And finally, the eunuch said, okay, try it for 10 days. And he did. And he looked better. Uh, it was called the Daniel diet, I guess. Okay? Uh, look what uh, Romans 14, 21 says. It is good not to eat meat. Uh, this was meat that was not, he's not saying red meat or don't have a steak or a hamburger. I'm not talking about that. The meat was taken and it was offered to the prostitutes and, and to the temples. It was offered to the gods. And, and you could go in the back of the temple and you could buy the meat. And that was offered to the gods and, and the idols. And look what he said. It's good not to eat meat or drink wine. Or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. In 1 Corinthians, he says, But take care that this right of yours does not, he's talking about Christian liberty, that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. So consider that maybe drinking one drink is going to be a stumbling block to other people. I was going to do that this morning. 
I'm going to bring in a glass of wine, but put grape juice in, in it, tell you that it was wine, and I was going to drink that right in front of you, and then play the part of just getting woozy and happy, happy juice. But just the very, very thought that here I am in the pulpit drinking alcohol. I think it would have been a stumbling block. It would have, some of you would have offended you. Some of you, it would have upset you. Uh, some of you would have said, the preacher shouldn't drink alcohol to begin with. You know? And you're absolutely correct because it becomes a stumbling block. Okay? But second of all, consider how alcohol has this mind and body effect and it can lead to addictions and different dangerous behaviors. Listen to what Isaiah 5.11 says. Woe to those who rise early in the morning, that they may run after strong drink, who tarry late into the evening as wine inflames them. It is possible that alcohol, once you're under the influence, and I don't know about you, but I know I don't touch it, Okay. I have done some stupid, stupid things with alcohol, under the influence of alcohol. And I know, and in all honesty, as I look back, the first drink set me off. And then with the first drink, I had to have another drink. I began to do stupid things, and you can gamble, you can have a fling, you can have a night on the town, you can uh, have a wild, loose, immoral relationship with somebody you don't even know. And you can spend your money that you need for other things, and the next day you say, where did my money go? I must have lost my money. Or you make a fool of yourself once the alcohol begins to bite you like a poisonous Snake. Ever been a fool? Ever played the fool with happy juice? I have. Many, many times. And I regret it. I regret it this day. And I think of the how I abuse my body. And I've been there. I know what it's like. And maybe your body type is such a, well, you can have one drink and, and, and you can stop. And those people are rare. Because when you gather around with other people, there's something about, you know, the social pressure and, and, and you just have one. And, All right, one more, one more. Oh, come on, you can have another one. Oh, all right, all right, one more. And that's what teenagers do. Teenage drinking in our land is just out of control. And here is a scene of somebody who got killed. But somehow he lives on. At least his memory lives on. And the driver was given 18 months in prison. And there was a crash in Nebraska that the driver was going over 90 miles an hour. And four out of these five girls who had alcohol in them, including the driver, were killed. Can you imagine your beautiful teen son or daughter no longer there? Is it wise? Is it wise to drink? And think of the parents. And it's something you don't forget. It's something you live with over one stupid drink. And that's how it begins. And that's why we need happy hour. Got to have some happy juice. Eh? It's all about money. If you drink one drink a day, it's going to cost you about $364 a year. Can you imagine what you could do with that money for the kingdom of God? In 2016, people spent $68 billion on alcohol. 
Last year, the rate reached $252 billion. You know what that is saying? It is saying that the trend is getting worse and worse, and more and more people are drinking. Just to be cool. Just to be happy. Just to have fun. I know, I'm probably preaching to the wrong crowd. But the issue is that, you know, it's unwise for Christians to drink alcohol. It's wise for Christians not to drink alcohol. Why? Because I really believe that alcohol will slowly and surely destroy you. Let me say a statement that I think I'm going to get in trouble for, but that's okay. I have never seen anything good come out of people who consume alcohol. I look at my past and I look at my family and I look at the, 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 the disaster that it caused. My uncles, I had four uncles, every single one of them were brothers in a family of ten. Somehow the, uh, the girls, uh, my aunts could get giggly and giddy and joke and and really, I think they could handle their alcohol. But all four of the brothers became alcoholic. One committed suicide. One died from liver cancer. My second, my third uncle died full of cancer in the end. And my dad had a heart attack at the age of 49 and died. Alcohol is dangerous. And I think there's an alternative for Christians. I don't think it's alcohol. Because okay? look what the scripture says. Don't be foolish, but understand the will of the Lord. And don't get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit of God. And I think it's wise to be filled with the Spirit of God. And we need to say no to the things of the world. I believe alcohol is Satan's drink for, for, for false joys and false happiness. And, and, and it's like, come on, drink, drink. And yet the Scripture says it will bite you in the end. Maybe not now, but later on. And may we take Paul's advice and, and just... Uh, he said, as for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified. And the world's interest in me has also. I died to the world, and I'm dying to the things of the world. I don't need alcohol to make me the person that God intends me to be. I need to be filled with the spirit of the living God. Jesus said this. Don't let, it, any, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. It's an invitation to come to Jesus and drink, not happy juice. But he said, but to drink the waters of life. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that point, the Spirit had not yet been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. And so I want to tell you, let's drink. Let's drink. Let's have a Spirit-filled party. Well, let's drink deeply of the Spirit of the Lord. And let's drink deeply of the very, very Word of God. And, and, and when it says, be filled, it's a command. And God is saying, I can fill you with my spirit, and it can be ongoing every single day. Be filled with the spirit of God, and you will enjoy life. I don't need alcohol to help me to be cool, or to be uh, joyful, or to be happy, or to forget my problems. I can take my problems, and I can bring them to the Lord, and say, Lord, you said I would be filled with your spirit. And believe that by faith. If God says get filled with the Spirit, by faith you believe that every single day. You ought to get filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what we need. And the trend amongst churchgoers is that more and more churchgoers are drinking. 
But when you look at that, they're being used less and less of the Lord to reach people for Christ, to bring people into the kingdom of God. Why? Because there's something about alcohol that numbs the mind, the body, to the truth of God. God says, get filled with the Spirit of God. So is it wise? You decide. Let the Lord speak to your hearts, and may the Spirit speak very clearly. As they come, uh, as the ministry team comes to do the closing hymn, I want you this morning to just pray. Say, Lord, I don't want to be like the world. I want to be like Jesus. I, you know, I can be like Samson and, and Daniel and John the Baptist and the Rechabites. And, and I can be different. Fill me with your spirit. So would you pray that this morning, that God would fill you with his Holy Spirit. We're going to close with, um, hopefully, this familiar um, chorus slash song, Sometimes Step, and we invite everyone to rise as we sing together. Oh, Lord, you are my God. I will ever praise you, the chorus says, that we will walk in his ways. and give us that joy, that peace that the world or even alcohol cannot give us, oh Lord. 
You tell us not to get drunk, O oh Lord. But Lord, you tell us to be filled with your Spirit. O oh, Spirit of God, by faith, we believe that, O oh Lord. Lord, help us to get filled with your word and your truth. And we know that your spirit takes the very word of God and applies it to our heart. And we get filled with the knowledge of the Almighty. And we get led by the spirit. We can accomplish great and marvelous and wonderful things, O Lord. I pray you fill us with your spirit, O God, so that we can be kingdom workers, O Lord. So even instead of spending our money upon alcohol, Lord, we can use it for the sake of the kingdom and, and help people out, O Lord, in need, O Lord Jesus. O Spirit of God, Spirit of God, would you fall fresh? Would you come upon us like never before? Would you come upon us, O Lord, and melt us and mold us and use us? Fill us, O Lord. Father, Psalm 8110 says, open your mouth and I will fill it. And that's what you said. So, Lord, we would open our mouths and we pray that you fill us with your word and your truth and your thoughts and with your spirit, O Lord God. Fill us today, O Lord, because you've got something better to offer us than the happy juice of the world. You have your spirit, and that satisfies unto eternal life. And Jesus, you said that someday you're going to drink the wine that makes the heart glad with us as we enter the kingdom of God. So, Lord, we turn our backs on the world, and we turn our eyes to Jesus this morning, the author and perfecter of our faith. We honor you, we praise you, we give you thanks. We ask all of this this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a good day.